Oh, YouTube, how are we? We good? I hope we're all good. So today's video is the things that I wish I knew before getting into bodybuilding. So I've, I've written out a little list just to make sure that I don't forget anything. Number one, straight off the bat, is blood work. Getting your blood work done. What is blood work? All the good stuff. So essentially blood work is blood tests and you can decide what it is that you wish to test for. So amazing website, MediChecks. They provide you with essentially what you could deem as like private healthcare in a sense, where if you went to your GP and said, I want some blood work, please, because I'm thinking about getting into bodybuilding and doing steroids, they would just tell you to piss off, which is fair enough, right? It's a bit of a waste of time and resources when there's a lot of other things going on. So you have to kind of accept that also, which is another point that I want to make is Private healthcare essentially is what you're looking at. So when you decide to get your blood work done, you can choose to this very specific one hormone if you want to, to test. However, I recommend the full sports hormone profile or panel. So that's gonna be testing for your hormones in general. So your testosterone, your estrogen, your prolactin, and all the other things that revolve around fertility. But then you also do need to make sure that you're checking your blood cells, red and white. You need to make sure that you're checking your liver, your kidneys, your heart health and cholesterol, diabetes risk, arthritis risk, and you can get a full breakdown of what's going on. The term ignorance is bliss can be very, very tempting, but if you do begin early and you ideally do all this before you go on cycle, you will then have a real nice clear picture of, okay, so this is what my body looks like when it's chilling and normal. So when the time comes when I come off, I've got things where I can work towards. If, if X number's still out on X, like my liver, then I can then look at supplementation on what do I need to avoid to get that marker back to where it was. Now the thing with people from like kind of my generation and onwards is blood work wasn't around or as accepted or as normal to do before we got going. So we'll always be guessing what is normal to us. So that's my biggest point of reference. That's obviously why I want to do it first because I think it's the most important. And then I would recommend every three to four months getting the full panel because then you can check things as you go. As you begin to ramp things up, you can check the whole like, uh, I'm gonna go on steroids for 10 weeks and then come off. Isn't actually true. You could do your blood work at 10 weeks and everything could be absolutely fine or within range in which you deem acceptable for your own personal preferences. And you may continue on, you may do it in 10 weeks and you're like, whoa, I need to come off right now. So you, genetically, you're gonna find out what you're predisposed to also. Where I sort of put it is, you see chain smokers live to their 100 with no side effects and you know signs of being a chain smoker and then you have the next person who never smoked and then ended up passing away with something you would think that was a smoker right so there is genetics involved in what you're predisposed to experiencing and what you may not but why take a chance when you can find out right so that's that you could also go deeper into getting ecg work done which is obviously where they check your heart there's many ways you can go into but as a point of reference is number one blood work lovely almost like the safety message is out the way there. So that moves me on to education and having an understanding for yourself and being independent thinking when it comes to steroid use and bodybuilding in general. So this means that you are actively looking for good resources to learn information, to understand compounds, understand their potential risks, understand side effects, understand how to minimize them. You don't just want to put your soul, heart and trust into someone, which we'll get onto in a minute. I really believe and with my clients, you're actively learning about it yourself because as you begin to learn, you are more confident and the more that you know about a subject, the better questions that you're able to ask. It's kind of like going from GCSEs to A-levels to a degree to master's to a PhD, right? PhD questions in the same subject as what the A-levels are, but so much more in depth because the level of comprehension is there. So education is massive. We've got people like Victor Black. We've got people like Dr. Dean and the SN education page. We've got the muscle mentors. We've got Joe Jeffries and we've got Chavez Broderick. Those are the guys who stand out for me as educators and who I learn from. So gather some knowledge. There's not a rush to begin the pursuit of getting massive. For a couple of months, you may learn so much more and you don't have to run into any unneeded side effects, which leads me to number three and who you decide or what if you do decide to have a coach. And my recommendation is 100% get a coach. Don't just listen to the big guy in the gym. Based on what we've already spoke about, 
don't just listen to the big guy in the gym. I'm going to say that again. Um, it's too, it's all too tempting, but now you, you could start asking the questions to the big person. What's your blood work like? The latest blood results. What things are you looking out for? So now you've got a little bit of knowledge just from this video. You can now begin to question the people that you're going to be getting advice from. And then you can start to think, well, that person doesn't even know what blood work is. So maybe I shouldn't listen to him. And now you're going to begin to understand that. And this can also be when it comes to finding a coach, because believe it or not, there's a massive divide in the industry between coaches who make the effort to ensure health of their clients when it comes to bodybuilding and those that just do not give a shit and don't really know much themselves. There's a massive divide, but it is changing. It is coming to the better. There's better coaches coming all the time and people are having bad experiences, which makes it really sad. And they're coming over to the, the, the more health conscious and aware coaches. So with that in mind, when it comes to choosing someone to work with, now you have some questions in play before you get started with a coach, you can ask them, do you do blood work analysis? That can be a massive checkpoint. You'll get an insight into how they're gonna treat you and your health just by asking that question. The next thing I would say, the coach is go off their transformations not based on who they are as an athlete you're hiring a coach you're not hiring an athlete right you're not going to put Cristiano Ronaldo as your manager for the team but you want him to play in your team so just because you follow someone who are massive look at their clients look at the service look at the reviews do some digging to figure out what are they like as a coach as opposed to what they're like as an athlete whether they're a pro or not it doesn't matter ask yourself what are they as a coach not who are they as an athlete? Because you're going to get a very different experience if you get a coach who's an amazing athlete, but their clients would suggest maybe otherwise. But also you've got to question the reviews. You've got to question health. Now you've got some questions in play beforehand because it's a massive, massive step. You're putting a lot of trust and money into someone and it could end up screwing you up big time. So with that in mind, as we're sort of touching on it, I would say budget. It's expensive and there has to be a willing of acceptance. When you look at your commitment to whether it is the drugs, the preventive measures, and then the coaching, it has to be in a position where you need to see it as a genuine investment into yourself, but most definitely be willing and okay with the fact that you can do it on a budget to an extent. But when I look at, when I think of it as like a hobby, or whether you're pursuing it to become pro, or it's just a hobby. It is one of the more expensive hobbies when you think you could just go and have a kickabout for five pound a week uh, and five aside. Whereas if you look at this stuff, you know, a coach is getting you through the door, starting off at 120, 130, 150 plus, 200, 200 a month, some coaches now. And you look at all the other stuff it requires. And then if you look at your food bill, your food bill is a lot compared to a normal comparative shop, but it also means in terms of the sacrifice and wanting to make it and what you're making gain, what you're going to be losing in terms of social time. So there's also budget in mind, but then on to the next one is the sacrifice it genuinely does take to really make serious progress. And also if you're looking at doing it from a, with anabolics involved, then you have to be even more responsible for your health in terms of you can't be living this rock style lifestyle where I don't advise where you're smashing gear and then you're smashing gear on nights out and then you're smashing shit food because you're hungover. You can just see now how that is a very treacherous buff. So sacrifice and being willing and being okay with with your social group probably changing a little bit and also just accepting that bodybuilding, unless you have a training partner, is, is a relative solitude sport. Obviously, it's not much of a team sport, but this is the next thing. As we segue into the changes, psychologies, you get into bodybuilding, it can, especially going on anabolics, very bro science, but there is more and more data coming out with neurotoxicity, which is the process in which what is happening to your brain when you do decide to take stuff. And it does change things. It can change things from a dopamine aspect. Dr. Dean's done some really good work, some podcasts on this, so if you're interested, but it does generally change your perspective on the world, how you feel about yourself and how you feel about others. But from like a bro science point of view, I think from both my own experience, but also from speaking to others, it kind of exaggerates the person that you are. Um, and the place that you're in. That's the only way I can sort of explain it. So if you're someone who's a little bit cut off, um, a little bit introverted, it just brings out that side of you of like, you don't want to speak to anyone, which we know is a bad, bad thing. Overall, you're not gonna feel good for it. So you have to have awareness of like, what sort of person am I? And what offers more value in life? Okay, I'm a bit introverted. So when I go to the gym, I'm gonna feel a bit introverted. So I need to make a, a double effort 
to be nice, to say hello to people and build some friendships and connections. If you're someone who has experiences anxiety, I've found, not for me personally, but from speaking to people, it heightens their moments where anxiety is quite bad. Same with depressive spells. It kind of just exaggerates things, but it also, which I found with me and some clients and some friends, it really dulls out the voice in your head which makes you doubt things. It makes you just so calm, almost really st like stoic, where you just, you kind of don't care. <laughs> it's the only way I can explain it. Whether it's personal situations, whether it's sort of relationship issues, you kind of just have this real element of like, why are we fucking, why are we even bothering? It doesn't matter. It re it's a really interesting one. I don't know if anyone else has experienced this, but it just makes you just really not care. But again, it's exaggerating the parts of who you are with that in mind too. Other experiences I've had with people who are maybe slightly jealous and a bit of a bad place when they've been on, it's like, boom. So there's an element of awareness that comes with your personality sort of being heightened. And being aware of it means that you can then be in control of how you interact socially. Which leads me on to the last two points. So ego, bodybuilding can bloody do an absolute shitstorm to your ego. Your sense of self can be intertwined with the fact that you're making some gains and you're getting a bit bigger. People start to compliment you. People start to ask you questions. People start to look at you when you're out and about. Maybe they say things and they're like, whoa, that is a very bad thing for someone who has an ego problem because now you will begin to associate the attention with being big. So then what can happen is you don't want to come off. You don't want to slow down. You want to keep going. You want to keep going. So your awareness of your ego and it being being stroked and how you combat that is being reminding yourself you're a person like no other person accepting that people find it fascinating and they respect the discipline it takes to be bigger and all that stuff but never let it become a part of you as a person detach yourself from those conversations it can be very treacherous particularly like if you're a little bit younger I, I think personally you know I had a massive ego problem when I was in like my early 20s started training got a bit of attention and it just wrapped myself up in that world so that's something to most definitely be aware of and when you're aware of it you can obviously be normal around people and don't talk about yourself find out what other people are going on help them out flip it around don't speak about yourself just because you got some muscles means it means shit oh means nothing the pursuit and discipline and doing it should be sort of what drives you i understand wanting to make the physical change but the problem is if we associate like i'll be happy when i'm fucking huge or i'll be happy when i'm shredded that never goes because you'll never be shredded enough you'll never be bigger enough and not feeling satisfied i think is actually a bad thing because you're not enjoying it. You're not enjoying the moment of doing it. You're associating the goal with something at the end. So you're missing out on all the life in the middle. You get to the end and it's still not enough. So bear that in mind also. Which leads me to the final one, which is again, just help others. As you begin to become more educated, as you begin to become more clued up, bigger, help people out. It's uh, the most rewarding thing is the impact that you have on someone else's life, not what you have on your own. And as you get a bit bigger or more leaner, people are gonna ask you questions, whether you're a coach or not. Like, I think like just as a general rule of thumb from all the self-help books that I've read, all the self-help books, the common theme is about contribution and helping other people. And if you're not a coach and maybe you work a job where you don't really have an opportunity to do that, the gym is can be your place to contribute and help other people and you know show them an exercise, train with them, make someone's day in an opportunity where you may not usually get to do that because the thing the, the, the impact we have on making someone else feel good has been scientifically proven to make you feel better as opposed to just pursuing your own goals. So it's actually proven that you'll feel more fulfilled. You'll have more connections that then is a butterfly effect where in a more introverted sport you're making friends connections and so that's what i wanted to end it on a nice positive spin so i hope this video helped if it did drop it a like much appreciated and i'll catch you in the next one